students welcome to my channel learning history made easy so i hope your revisions are going on very well today we will be explaining the second part of the preparatory examination paper 2022 this is the second paper in your passing package series if anyone wants to download the pdf notes of the same the link is given in the description box you can go there and you can download the pdf notes and if anyone is seeing the channel for the first time or if you have not subscribed to my channel please do subscribe and share it with your friends and also click the bell button to receive notifications whenever i upload new videos so without wasting time let us get into the video so today's video i will be explaining uh, three or four five mark questions which will be continued in the next video so let us see uh, the next question which we have to see that is describe the chief characteristics of Gandhara school of art so what are we going to write this is a direct question chief characteristics of Gandhara school of art so as an introduction you can write Gandhara art Kanishka was a paid, great patron of art. Many important constructions of art are found at Gandhara, Mathura, Kanishkapura and Takshashila. And the period of Kushanas is important for the growth of Gandhara art. So these points you can write as a small introduction because the 5 mark question just a small 2 or 3 sentence introduction will be enough. Then you can go on to the uh, answer. Chief Characteristics of Gandhara School of Art Life-size statues of Gautama Buddha were carved in this school. Until then, Buddha's existence was shown in the form of symbols like lotus, umbrella, etc. So, until Gandhara School came, um, Buddhist existence was shown in the form of just symbols. But when Gandhara School came, life-size statues of Gautama Buddha were carved. Utmost care was given to the symmetry of the body while carving the statues. That is, muscles and moustaches were shown in the natural settings and great care was given in carving all these uh, symmetry of the body. The folds and turns of clothes were exhibited with minute care and skill. On the statues, folds and turns of clothes were exhibited with minute care and skill. The ornaments that were carved on the statues also received much attention. And this added to the physical beauty of the statue. Polishing the statue was also an important feature of Gandhara school of art. And the main materials which were used for preparing the statues were stone, terracotta and clay. And the technique of making the statues was Greek. But the idea, inspiration and personality were Indian. So Greek techniques were used by the idea but uh, the idea, inspiration and the personalities were Indian. And as a conclusion you can write, according to Dr. R. C. Majumdar, the Gandhara artist had the hands of Greek but the heart of an Indian. So that sentence you can write as a conclusion according to Dr. R. C. Majumdar, the Gandhara artist had the hands of Greek but the heart of an Indian. So like that you can complete the answer. So let us move on to the next question. Explain the conquest of Samudra Gupta. So again we start with a small introduction. Samudra Gupta was the greatest king of the Gupta dynasty and he ruled for 40 years. He was an ambitious ruler and he wanted to become a Chakravarti or an emperor. So those uh, two lines you can write as an introduction. Then you can directly move on to the conquest. So Samudra Gupta is known for his military conquest. He waged a number of wars in order to establish a vast empire. We already said that he wanted to become a Chakravarti. His main policy was of expansion and aggression. Allahabad pillar inscription is the main source to know about the conquest of Samudra Gupta. It was composed by Harisena who was a court poet and commander in chief of the army of Samudra Gupta. Samudra Gupta's conquest is divided into four groups. So which are those four groups? First one, North Indian Campaign. Cor conquest of Forest Kingdom, second one. South Indian Campaign and Conquest of Border States. So North Indian, 
South Indian, Forest Kingdom and Border States. These are the four divisions or four groups uh, regarding Samudra Gupta's conquest. Now regarding the North Indian campaign, the early years of Samudra Gupta's rule was spent subduing the provinces of Gangetic Plains called as Aryavarta. And according to Allahabad Pillar inscription, he defeated nine kings in North Indian campaign and he called it Digvijaya. The nine defeated kings were Nandin, Balavarman, Chandravarman, Nagadatta, Nagasena, Ganapati Naga, Achyuta, Mathila and Rudradeva. Uh, you need not learn the nine names completely. At least two or three names you can write. That is, the nine kings defeated were Nandin, Balavarman, Chandravarman, etc. Next, conquest of forest kingdoms. He conquered the forest kingdoms of Jabalpura, Reva, Nagpura and Bagelkhand in the Vindhya region, that is Central India region. Then, uh, South Indian campaign. After establishing his authority in North India, then he turned his attention towards South. Samudra Gupta defeated 12 kings of South India. North India 9 kings, South India 12 kings. They were reinstated in their respective positions even after conquest. That is, they were allowed to stay in their own uh, uh, respective positions even after conquest. These kings became his vassals and they accepted to pay tribute. Samudra Gupta called this Dharma Vijaya because he allowed them to uh, remain in their respective positions. Samudra Gupta called, himself called it as Dharma Vijaya. The 12 kings defeated by him, Mahendra of Kosala, Vyagaraja of, sorry, Vyagaraja of Mahakantara, Mahendra of Pistapura, Vishnugopa of Kanji, Hastivarman of Vengi, etc. 12 kings were there. Two, three names you can learn. Next is conquest of border states. The boundary states conquered by Samudra Gupta were Kamarupa in Assam, Samatata in Bengal, Katripura in Punjab and Roilkand. After all these conquests, after conquering all these areas, he performed Ashwamedha sacrifice to commemorate his victory. And he took the title Ashwamedha Parakrama. He issued gold coins with the figures of horse on them. And they were one among the eight types of gold coins issued by Samudra Gupta. And Samudra Gupta's empire extended from Kashmir in the north to Tamil Nadu in the south and Punjab in the west to Bengal in the east. So these uh, points you have to include in the question conquest of Samudra Gupta. First you start with a small introduction. Then his four conquests that is North Indian, Forest Kingdom, South Indian and Border States. Then just a conclusion that is from where to where his empire extended he performed Ashwamedha sacrifice after his conquest so this is how you write the answer for that question Samudra Gupta's conquest okay now let us move on to the next question describe the village administration of Chola rulers so here regarding Chola administration again a small introduction they had a good administrative system which was centralized and king was not absolute. Now uh, you can start with the village administration. Village autonomy was an important feature of Chola administration. People of the village looked after the administration through their own elected representatives. So villages were autonomous and they had their own elected representatives. Uttara Merur inscription of Parantaka 1 gives us clear information about the village administration. So Uttara Merur inscription by Parantaka 1 is the main source which gives us information about the administration. According to this inscription, village was divided into 30 parts called as Kudumbu. One representative from each unit was elected for a period of one year. And the members were elected through a lucky draw system which was called as Kuduvalai. Villagers as and now what is Kuduvalai? That is a lucky draw system. So here in detail the steps are given. Villagers assembled in the temple on the day of election. Name of the candidates to be elected were written on palm leaf and it was put in a pot. A small boy was asked to put, uh, pick one leaf uh, one after the another in the presence of everybody and thus uh, the representatives were elected. Elected representative had to work in the annual committee, garden committee and tank bun committee. These committees were called as variums and its representatives were known as Varia Perumakkal. 
These committees worked for 360 days and the duty of village committee were protection of village property, collecting taxes, protection of lakes, temples, forests, etc. And the resolutions of committees were written and central administration did not interfere in the village administration unnecessarily. They were autonomous. Now there were some minimum qualifications and disqualifications to become members of this village committee. Now the qualification, the candidate should possess a minimum of half acre of taxable land. He should reside in his own house in his own site. And he should be more than 35 years and less than 70 years of age. He should possess knowledge of Vedas, Brahmanakas and commerce. He should possess a good character. Now there were some disqualification that is those who are not eligible uh, to become members. If he is a member of any committee continuously for the previous three years, then he is disqualified for re-election. After three years, he is disqualified for re-election. Those in committee who do not submit accounts and his close relatives are also disqualified. Then alcoholic, thieves, those accused of murdering Brahmin and committing adultery were also disqualified. These were some of the minimum qualifications and mis disqualifications followed in the village administration. Now as a small uh, one line conclusion you can write, some scholars have termed the Chola village administration as small democratic states. That is the Chola village administration was like a small democratic state. So like this you can conclude the answer. So now the next question, describe the religious and Rajput policy of Akbar. So here this question is in two parts, religious policy as well as Rajput policy. So let us start the answer, Akbar the Great. Again an introduction, Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar was a son of Humayun and Hamida Banu Begum. Humayun was wandering from place to place along with his wife after he lost his kingdom. And it was during this situation that Akbar was born at Amarkot in 1542. Now directly we move on to because it is a 5 mark answer we cannot explain more. We just have to stick on to the points. Now first is the Rajput policy. Rajputs were powerful enemies of Mughals. And Akbar tried to win the support of Rajputs by adopting measures like friendly relation, cooperation, entering into matrimonial alliance etc. Akbar married Jodabai as a part of matrimonial alliance, the daughter of Bihari Mal of Ambar, that is Jaipur. Raja Surjan Rai of Ranathambur voluntarily accepted the overlordship of Akbar. Ramachandra, the ruler of Kalinjar, also surrendered to Akbar. The rulers of Jodhpur and Bikaner also accepted the suzerainty of Akbar. But the only Rajput state which refused to accept Akbar's overlordship was Mewar. The capital of Mewar Chitur was captured by Akbar by defeating Uday Singh in 1568. Uday Singh continued to fight against the Mughals and his son Rana Pratap Singh also continued to fight after the death of his father. The battle of Haldigarh that is in 1576 was fought between Mughals and Rajputs. Rana Pratap Singh suffered heavy losses and Mewar was completely occupied by Akbar and Rajput kings were allowed to retain their internal autonomy. Akbar had many Rajput commanders like Raja Todar, Mal, Raja Man Singh, etc. So that was the Rajput policy of Akbar. See children, if anyone wants detailed explanation of all these topics, please go to the chapter wise videos in that each and every topic I have explained in detail. So you can uh, refer to those videos. Next is religious policy of Akbar. Akbar was one of the most enlightened and liberal monarchs of medieval India. He abolished the pilgrimage tax in 1563 and he also abolished Jasiya. Hindus were appointed to high post and he took part in the celebration of various Hindu festivals. He prohibited child marriage and sati and encouraged widow remarriage. Now Din e Ilahi. Akbar founded a new religion that is Din e Ilahi called as Divine Monotheism. This religion was based on the principle of peace for all and it was an attempt to unite the people of different faith into brotherhood. In 1582, he built the Ibadat Khana at Fatehpur Sikri 
and religious leaders from all religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Christianity and Islam would meet here and hold religious discussions. Akbar assimilated the general principle of various religions and founded this new religion that is din e ilahi The followers of this religion are expected to respect all religion, worship fire, then celebrate their birthdays in company of other people and not to marry older women or minor girls. Akbar did not force anybody to follow his religion but it lost its importance after the death of Akbar. So that was about the religious and Rajput policy of Akbar. Now the next question discusses socio-religious reforms of Basaveshwara. So here Basaveshwara, he was uh, like an introduction, now about his life the question is not asked, it is about his social-religious reforms. So we just write two, three sentences um, as an introduction, his birthplace, parents, names, etc. He was born in 1132 at Bhage Wadi. His parents were Madrasa and Madlam BK and he was appointed as Karanika by Kalachuri King Bijila. And he was not influenced by power, wealth or worldly life. He carried out his responsibilities through honest services. He took a vow to remove caste system, blind belief, plurality of God and idol worship which were all practiced in those days. So he was working hard or he took a promise to remove all these evil practices. He travelled across the state and created awareness among the people and he made it clear that caste system does not have the base of Dharma Shastra. He encouraged interdining and gave Linga Diksha to untouchable Nagadeva and accepted his hospitality. He also encouraged intercaste marriage and performed the marriage of Brahmin Madhuvaya's daughter and Harijan Haralaya's son. He prevented animal sacrifice and he said that Dayave Dharmada Moolavaya, that is compassion, is the base of religion. Then his philosophy is called as Shakti Vishishtadvaita philosophy. He propounded this philosophy and gave prominence to the worship of Linga. He gave opportunity to all to wear Ishta Linga irrespective of caste and gender and all those who wore Linga came to be called as Lingayata. Ashtavarna principles had to be followed by Lingayat which were taught at the time of Diksha. And what are these Ashtavarna principles? Obedience to Guru, worship of Linga, reverence to Jangama, smearing ash on forehead, wearing of Rudraksha, sipping Padodaka, partaking food offered to God and uttering Namah Shivaya that is Panchakshara Mantra. He propounded the path of devotion for salvation and he criticized caste system. He said that a man's status is decided by his competency and not by his caste and all are equal before Shiva. He condemned idol worship, holy bath and the worship of stones and trees. Through his vachanas, he brought into open the vain display of devotion by the people. He also said that work is another form of devotion, kaya kave kailasa. He upheld the dignity of labor and also said that we should inculcate simplicity, good character, love and sympathy. Basaveshwara gave importance to inner purity rather than outer purity. Then Anubhava Mantapa, he established Anubhava Mantapa at Kalyana to spread his philosophy. This is also called as Vachana Mantapa. Religious discourses or discussions were held and social and religious problems were discussed here. Allama Prabhu presided over the religious discourses and Pasaveshwara had composed nearly 5000 Vachanas. His pen name was Kudala Sangama Deva. So all these points you have to write about Basaveshwara. So still uh, two or three more five mark questions are pending that I will be continuing in the next video. So till that time please continue to revise the last um, uh, model paper as well as the questions given in this paper. The next video I will be uploading very soon. In case of any doubts you can ask in the comment session and also don't forget to like, share and subscribe to my channel. Your likes and shares will be of a great encouragement for me to make more and more videos. 
So I hope to see you all soon in the coming video. Thank you for watching.